I'm Leanne Schmidt. Uh, I'm a PhD in cognitive neuroscience uh, and a researcher at INSERM, which is the French uh, National Health and Research uh, uh, Institute. Uh, and uh, I'm working at the Paris Brain Institute, which is localized at the Salpetriere Hospital in Paris. So where I co-lead together with the last author of this paper, Philippe Fossati, the control interception attention team. And so we are a team of uh, cognitive neuroscientists doing basic research in cognitive neuroscience and also some clinical research because half of the team is clinicians uh, in psychiatry. That's why we are st we're studying these effects of ketamine in depressed patients and um, I'm very happy and thank you for the invitation to, to present you this work uh, today at the Toronto Club. So I changed with the, the, the title, which is, uh, well, we actually ask, can we change depressive beliefs uh, um, with ketamine treatment in treatment-resistant depressed patients? Um, and what we mean with changing depressive beliefs is that we were studying something which is called the optimistic belief updating that I'm going to explain to you a little bit later um, what I mean by that. So just to center or position the research a little bit more. So many of you might, might be familiar with this uh, cognitive model of depression from Aaron Becker, um, which basically um, postulates, says, that uh, depression is maintained or characterized by a triad of, of negative beliefs. These beliefs can be actually about oneself, uh, about the world, and about the future. And uh, basically, depressed patients ruminate within, with these beliefs, around these beliefs, and uh, can't escape this uh, triad. And it is sought to maintain uh, the, the, the disease in place. But uh, very recently, actually, um, it's been shown or it's been suggested that actually, while this triad is really at the center of the, uh, of the disease, maintains the uh, disease and is, um, is, is insensitive or resistant to um, information that contradicts or disconfirms uh, these negative beliefs, uh, which is also called like the devaluing of belief disconfirming information, also called the, the concept of cognitive immunization, um, put forward by, by Matthias Kube and colleagues. Uh, um, it basically states that we are different cognitive strategies such as uh, um, devaluing information that contradicts these negative beliefs. So uh, the disease, the patients actually maintain the disease in place and that it's primary linked to the disease. And at the same time, research from cognitive neuroscience, cognitive and clinical neuroscience has shown that um, depressed patients lack something which is called uh, an optimism bias in the belief updating, which is also termed the good news, bad news bias. This bias is very important for mental health and also physical health motivation. And basically is a kind of confirmation bias where you um, update beliefs um, more often when this disconfirming information is actually favorable, that uh, positive, like for example, you overestimated something bad happening and then you learn basically that this is much less frequent than what you thought and then you take this information much more into consideration than information that is negative basically that tells you well you should update your beliefs because you kind of underestimated something bad happening and you should become more realistic about it and so this is negative information that you tend to neglect and this is called the good news bad news bias and has been shown to be linked to mental health uh, motivation physical health uh, it's something it's a bias but it's a healthy bias basically and in depressed patients there are these two studies by Christoph Korn and colleagues and Neil Garrett and colleagues and Taylor Sherrod that have shown that depressed patients lack this good news bad news bias they're kind of very realistic or which is also sometimes called um, um, re um, realistic pessimism Basically, they take into consideration the good news and the bad news as well, and uh, don't, aren't biased at all in their belief updating. So we were asking, before I go to the research question, I make a little um, escape and uh, tell you more about the treatment-resistant depression and ketamine, and I know you know a lot about already, so just uh, to position it a little bit more, like, is that um, treatment and depression, the one out of three patients with major depressive disorder, they don't 
respond to conventional, anti conventional antidepressant treatments, such as SSRIs, for example, that target the monoaminergic system in the brain. And um, in recent years, uh, um, sub-anesthetic infusions of ketamine, so very small doses, um, have become a very promising alternative for treating treatment-resistant depressed patients um, with very rapid anti rapid antidepressant effects that peak within 24 hours after a single infusion, which had made it very, very promising in treating, using ketamine, for example, also in emergency rooms, uh, because it also has very um, promising effects on suicidal ideation, decreasing these ideas and avoiding the risk for suicide. And um, what, when it comes to more empiric studies, so there are obviously a lot of clinical trials going on about ketamine showing its efficiency um, in depression, um, but only very few studies have looked uh, from basic neuroscience or basic cognitive science has looked at uh, um, empirical effects of subanesthetic ketamine um, on depressive beliefs. Um, there's one study from Hasler and colleagues uh, about the negative self uh, schemas. Uh, uh, ketamine can be effective in depressed patients. And there are two studies out that have looked in healthy participants where ketamine is usually used as a model for psychosis, early psych uh, psychosis. And these studies have looked um, at, for example, ketamine effects in the confidence in contingencies when we learn from contingencies um, and also um, when we make decisions under uncertainty where the ketamine in the healthy participants makes everything more noisy. <laughs> and renders them more psychotic and uh, um, disrupts, dis disrupts actually the learning from contingencies um, and uh, making sense out of uncertainty or putting the uncertainty in the right place to be able to make uh, robust um, and uh, choices. So this is just to say there's not a few work out uh, about these ketamine effects on, on cognition and decision-making um, learning. Um, and that's why our study basically we wondered, given our clinical background and also our background in basic basic cognitive neuroscience, whether ketamine actually can restore optimism biases in belief updating in TOT patients. So I just realized that you can't see everything. <laughs> okay. Um, are the cognitive and antidepressant effects of ketamine linked? Meaning that if we can measure actually the effect on the good news, bad news bias in belief updating, is this effect linked to the antidepressant effect of ketamine that we can measure with clinical scales? Um, and then we, the third question uh, we were asking out of curiosity, what could be underlying computational mechanisms of these ketamine beliefs, ketamine effects on belief updating? Okay, so uh, this is our experimental design. We were observing patients in their measurement based using a measurement based uh, care approach. Um, so this is not a clinical trial. Every patient got his treatment that was prescribed in the clinical setting. So each patient um, got the dosage um, specific um, to to, to his disease, actually, to treat his disease. Uh, nothing, the treatment wasn't randomized. We don't have a placebo arm, but actually we have a within patient design. That means that actually we tested the patient, the same patient three times, um, 24 hours before receiving ketamine as a, as a new treatment strategy. Um, then four hours after a single first ketamine infusion, and patients got a second ketamine infusion 20, uh, 40, 48 hours later. And then we re-saw the patient at the third ketamine infusion, which was seven days after the first infusion. And this is our second uh, T2, or actually third uh, testing time point. At each testing point, point, which is displayed like here in red, um, we measured um, the depression using the Montgomery Asperg depression rating scale, the MADRS, and we had the belief updating task. Uh, um, the population, so our main interest were the, the treatment resistant patients. We had got 26 patients, uh, 16 male and 10 female patients. Um, the age, they were around their 50s. Uh, 
um, these years of higher education, um, it starts with uh, university, like the first year of college, uh, and then goes up uh, like bachelor's degrees, master's degrees, thesis. So they're like four years, 3.9 years uh, after um, the high school degree on average. And uh, they're depressed. So the MAD, the math score is about uh, 37.1. We also had a group of healthy controls. And again, these healthy controls, they didn't receive ketamine, um, but we actually tested them in a more like a methodological question to rule out other effects. Since we saw the patients three times, each time you do the task, well, each time actually <laughs> you do the task a little bit better just because actually you, you just know the task better. So this is the sequential testing effect and we wanted to to reduce this concern, this worry by testing actually healthy controls also two times and then comparing, taking out this variance links to, to the sequential testing to be able to be more um, sure about the effects of ketamine. Um, the clinical characteristics of the patients, it's um, so they were like uh, uh, five uh, to six years actually uh, of uh, the current episode. Um, the age on the onset of the illness was in their 30s. Uh, we had some patients who had also bipolar depression, six. Um, then the, um, the depression severity uh, was, uh, they were pretty severe, like most of them were severe, 20 patients out of si uh, 26. Um, we measured treatment resistant with the Maudsley um, um, mostly questionnaire to, to have an idea about how severe the resistance is, but actually resistance was also determined by like a failure of two different antidepressant treatment trials prior to starting ketamine. And so all patient, patients it had at least uh, tried two different antidepressants in the past um, before they got actually treated with ketamine. Um, obviously, ketamine wasn't the only treatment. They had also additional antidepressant treatments, which are listed here and in the supplement of the paper. Um, an interesting thing is also that we measured the expectancy of treatment outcomes uh, of ketamine um, um, on, on scales. And um, while these numbers don't say much here, but actually what, uh, what you can get out of it, that those patients who uh, responded best uh, with ketamine measured with the MRDRS, the Montgomery Aspect Depression Rating Scale, were also the patients who expected more benefits from, from the ketamine treatment, which is interesting in itself uh, and shows that there are also some psychological effects, factors that, caused, uh, that contribute to the efficiency of the treatment. Um, so first of all, the, the, the clinical effect of ketamine. So, in line with the literature about uh, ketamine in, uh, in treatment-resistant depression. What you see here is the Montgomery Asperg depression rating scale on the y-axis. And on the x-axis, you have like the different testing time points. So at baseline, T0, 24 hours before the first infusion, and at, at T1, T1, which is four hours after the first infusion. And you already see here in the box plot, so this is each patient uh, before and after. Here are the distributions, and there is a small effect that they're already, the MRDS score already decreases four hours after a uh, first single infusion. And then it becomes even more decreased when you look baseline versus seven days after uh, a first infusion, which is at the third infusion of ketamine, um, um, the MRDS score decreases even more. And uh, this you can also see here in the distributions of the patients uh, on the right side. Now that we have uh, checked that actually ketamine is beneficial um, uh, on the depression, we were wondering about like what's happening with the belief updating and the good news, bad news bias that we can measure um, um, with this kind of task. So I don't know why. <laughs> okay, so the task actually consists of 40 trials. On each trial, so now I'm going to show you one type of trial, people see like a negative future event on the screen, like for example, losing a wallet. And they have to tell us, well, how much do they expect this is going to happen in their near future? And say, for instance, you say, okay, this is going to happen to me like 80% uh, 
with a probability of 80%. So I'm pretty sure it's going to happen to me. And then I'm learning that it is basically much less frequent than what I thought. By the INSEE is actually a French um, um, uh, poll uh, foundation that makes different uh, polls across the society and, and measures basically how frequent things are in the French society. And so if they tell me, okay, it's only 50% of the time this happens to people in the French society, then it's actually good news because it's it's much less frequent than what I first thought. So that's why this is called a good news drive. The base rate is bigger than my first estimate. Uh, sorry, is smaller than my first estimate. Sorry, this is an error. And then the, each patient has, has the opportunity to update the belief, knowing now that it is less frequent, actually, and say, OK, well, knowing that it's only 50%, OK, do I make decreasing or actually uh, not uh, my, my, my estimate that this is going to happen? And usually what healthy people do in this case, actually, they decrease their estimation um, and here like 50%. Like so they update the beliefs towards the base rate. Um, and in a negative trial or a bad news trial, so this is really around other ways around, the base rate is more important than the first estimator. I'm losing my wallet. I'm saying, okay, no, this is never going to happen, maybe 20%. Uh, and then I'm learning, okay, it's much more frequent than what I thought. It's 50% of the time this happens to people. And then I'm, if I'm taking information, this information into account, I'm updating my belief uh, by increasing it a little bit. But if I have a good news, bad news bias, I'm going to do this much less than I would do for a good news trial, like only saying only 25 So increasing my update only for 5%, versus I increased my or removed my update actually over 15% in a good news trial. So this is the good news, bad news bias that it's actually, I'm considering the good news much more than the, the bad news. So when we now tested the patients, uh, um, we observed the following. So here on the y-axis, you leave, see the belief updating that we actually normalized by the estimation error. There was a price that I'm going to tell you more about in a few seconds, in a few slides. Um, here on the left, uh, you see the, the health controls, um, first assessment and uh, one week later when we tested them again. So this is the order effect uh, to see basically does the bias change the more often I do the task. And it does a little bit. And actually I'm realizing this is a set of health controls that, um, that we presented earlier actually. Um, it's a set of younger healthy controls. In the paper, we have a set of healthy controls that is actually really age-matched to, to the depressed patients, but the profile is basically the same. People update more after good news, which is this line here, than after bad news. And this is pretty stable across uh, the times actually you do the task. Whereas the patients basically, they... Um, um, they show the following profile. Um, before at baseline, they update slightly more after good news than after bad news, but not that much more actually. And there is a significant three-way interaction compared to the healthy controls that the more often they do the task, so after ketamine, the more actually they update after pos uh, positive news and the less they update after, after negative news. So the, basically they start, there is a good news, bad news bias that emerges after ketamine treatment, and that emerges much more compared to sequential testing in healthy controls. And this emergence of the good news, bad news bias in the uh, depressed patients after ketamine correlates with um, the depression score at one week of treatment. So those patients basically that reduce um, with um, that showed a reduction in the depression score are also those that show more um, updating biases, cognitive uh, good news, bad news biases in their updating after one week of treatment, of ketamine treatment. And so to answer our second question, we now wondered, so this is a correlation and with some statistical models, such as for example, mediation models, you can test whether um, the bias, the emergence of the good news, bad news bias actually plays not only, doesn't only correlate, but actually plays uh, a mediating role um, for the effect of ketamine on uh, the depression. 
So this is what you see here. So we have like this total effect of ketamine treatment after one week on the MRDIS score, on the, um, on the depression score, it decreases after one week of treatment. And with this mediation model, we can first test actually how the ketamine affects, uh, sorry, belief updating. This is what is called pass A effector. And this is what I showed you just before that after one week of ketamine treatment, the bi uh, belief updating is much more biased then uh, at baseline, that's what you see here on the y-axis of this graph. And then, then we control for this effect of ketamine on belief updating biases. We can also test how much the bias links again to the depression independently of treatment. And this is what is called the pass B effect, and uh, um, which was also significant, meaning that and negative, meaning that those patients who were more biased in their belief updating in a good way, like more optimistically biased, were also those patients who decreased more um, their, their depression after one tre a week of treatment. This is the correlation I just showed you before. And now we can take in this mediation um, model, the pass A and the pass B effect, basically the correlation coefficients or the regression coefficients, multiply them and see whether actually this product is significantly different from zero. Um, and if it does, basically we can infer that this effect um, formally mediates the effect of the treatment on the clinical um, um, depression score. And which was indeed the case. And it was a partial mediation because actually once we control for the mediator, this effect of ketamine on depression was still significant. Um, which means that there might be other hidden variables that uh, might also in addition play a role when depression decreases after treatment or after one week of, week of uh, ketamine treatment. And lastly, we were interested in looking into like the potative mechanisms of this effect of ketamine on belief updating. And here we used a reinforcement learning um, model, a computational model or based on reinforcement learning that basically assumes that when we estimate our, our belief of losing our valid, our first estimate, um, this is contrasted to a base rate. That's what I'm always showed. And when we learn, for example, or when we, when we learn the base rate, we are kind of uh, surprised. Uh, we can be positively surprised, learning that it is much less uh, frequent than we thought, um, positively because it's a negative event and which is less frequent than, than we thought. Or we can be uh, negatively surprised, uh, learning that it is actually much more frequent than, than, than what you actually um, thought initially. And this is called uh, a prediction error, also, or also an estimation error the difference between our belief and the space rate. And the model assumes that the belief updating is now proportional to this estimation error, to the surprise. Um, and the surprise is actually scaled. The effect of the surprise on our belief updating is scaled, what is called the learning rate. Um, and given this, we can then update our belief. And uh, if we have, like, if we take the surprise into account, or, um, well, we, we update uh, toward the base rate. And the learning rate here, um, which is um, this LR <laughs> um, parameter is a free parameter, which means that it actually varies across participants, um, scaling the effect of the surprise on the belief updating. Um, and this is super interesting because when we now fit this model to the observed belief updating, we can basically find this LR this learning rate parameter with, um, for each participant and then correlate it and see whether it changes after or before treatment. Uh, um, and so just to explain this learning rate a little bit more in this computational model is the learning rate is a hidden Latin parameter that varies inter-individually. And it is composed either of um, the sum of two other parameters, which is called the alpha and asymmetry when we have a good news trials, when our estimation error is actually positive. Um, it's uh, subtracted when the estimation error is negative. And all what this means is basically that when we are positively uh, surprised, well, the learning rate, um, if we are asymmetric and we put more weight on this positive surprise, well, the fact to, to add to uh, this alpha parameter, which is basically a classical learning rate, uh, how much do we learn from surprise, um, we add 
um, the weight of the positive surprise, the asymmetry, and then we scale upscale actually the surprise. But um, if you are asymmetric and we actually basically um, don't take into account the negative surprise, the negative estimation error, then our learning rate alpha subtracts this asymmetry, our tendency not to take account actually the valence of the uh, the negative valence of the estimation error, and so we weight down the weight of the surprise on the belief updating. Um, so this is all to say, basically, this is the, the heart of the computational model. Um, and, but the interesting thing is really that it varies across people. And so as a parameter that we can obtain by fitting the model to the observed belief updating. And that is what it gives you. Um, when you now actually look at the learning rate, and again, this is the composite of this alpha, which is the standard learning rate plus asymmetry when we positively surprised, or minus, minus the asymmetry parameter when we negatively surprised. Um, we can then look how it varies at baseline, four hours after ketamine and one week after ketamine. And all what it says is actually it's the other side of the coin of the observed behavior, what, we, what I already showed you, is that basically the, we learn patients learn as much from positive and negative surprise before treatment, um, which is basically reflected by the absence of uh, or the very weak um, optimism bias before treatment. Um, and then they learn much more after positive. So the learning rate is much higher after the positive estimation errors or surprise than after negative estimation errors. Uh, for four hours after ketamine, and this is confirmed also one week after ketamine. So this is a nice uh, way actually to mathematically formalize um, the behavior we saw, and then to obtain this learning rate parameter that is very individual and varies across patients. And here we just do a categorical split down what happens before and after ketamine, but you can imagine to use this also for more explorative uh, analyses uh, to correlate to other um, things we did not do in this <laughs> in this study, but this is basically the promise of using a computational model uh, in, in psychiatry. So to conclude, um, what we observed is ketamine improved uh, the treatment resistant um, depression um, this clinical effect was associated to the emergence of an optimistically biased belief updating, an optimism bias and belief updating. And this was um, potatively underpinned by a reinforcement learning-like mechanism, which with, with stronger asymmetrical learning from surprise uh, and less sensitivity to negative, uh, negative surprise after ketamine treatment. Um, and uh, this could be useful actually for drug enhanced psychotherapy that um, that could reinforce the antidepressant action of ketamine by following up actually it kind of opened the door towards uh, making the patients patients more sensitive to belief disconfirming information less sensitive to negative belief disconfirmation information disconfirming information and more sensitive to positive um, belief is confirming information, which could be really at the heart of a psychotherapeutic uh, um, treatment that adds to um, the antidepressant pharmacological treatment. Um, the limitations and open questions of this work, there are many other open questions, these are just two. So again, as I said in the beginning, this is not a clinical trial, so we didn't aim to uh, show the superior to, uh, that ketamine is much better than any an other antidepressant. Uh, um, that was not at all the purpose of the study. It's a study that just looked at what are the cognitive effects or what is the effect of ketamine um, in a measurement-based care approach um, setting, clinical setting on um, the cognitive model of depression. Um, and now one open question that we try to pursue in the team is actually look at the specificity of the treatment of ketamine um, on cognitive on belief updating and other emotional processes in, in comparison to uh, classical antidepressants. Okay. Um, before ending, I want to thank our funding um, from the National Research Agency in France that funded this research. And um, to my co-authors, Philippe Pusati, who is the senior author together with me on this paper, Tally Sherrod, who is very well known about her work on this good news, bad news um, bias uh, in healthy, but also um, 
um, patients, health participants and patients, um, Dr. Hugo Goldman, who is the first author of, of this work, uh, and uh, Dr. Anne Claret, and Orphée Morlas, who is a medical intern today, uh, nowadays, um, recently, and who did her master's thesis on this work. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Leanne, for, for presenting your work. Um, I really want to encourage everybody, if you have any question, please write it in the chat. Um, but while you're maybe collecting your idea, I can maybe um, kick off. And um, I just wanted to, to ask you very quickly about your study design, right? So you were uh, administering this um, a belief update task uh, before any treatment. Uh, and then again, after the first infusion and then after the third one. And I was wondering if in the designing this study, there was like a reason like if, behind, I mean, I'm sure there was, <laughs> sorry, it's a bit late, uh, but, but what I was wondering is like, do you think that there is a, a sort of cognitive effects of ketamine and you were interested in the acute, meaning right after the first one, and then after the third one, or if it was more dictated by um, the practice of the clinic, and if you can comment yeah. on that. So the response is both actually. So uh, obviously we were very um, guided by the reality of, uh, of the clinical setting. So we could only actually follow the patients um, what, what was actually foreseen for them in the clinical setting. But at the same time, we choose uh, the treatment time points or the testing time points because like we really wanted to see what happens really precautiously, uh, very early. We know that actually the antidepressant effects peak at 24 hours after a single infusion. Um, that could have been actually a way to test also. But um, like, again, it was patients come in actually, and then they leave. Uh, and so we would have needed them to come in again 24 hours later for nothing, just like a cognitive task, which is pretty, pretty difficult um, to convince them and to do. And, um, and the four hours again was were very interesting because we were in the beginning thinking, okay, could there be really early effects uh, that emerge two to four hours? Um, and here we did two hours. Now we are testing at four hours already. Uh, at two hour, here we're doing four hours. Now we are testing at two hours to see when it actually emerges and whether it emerges that early. Um, and then one, one week later to have like the more sustained effect uh, um, dictated by, by the clinics. And then now more future work in the lab, we're going to test the patients actually 24 hours and 24 hours before and after to see, uh, well, to be more in line with the literature that shows the peak at 24 hours. Yeah. Right. Thank you very much. I think maybe in the interest of time, we're going to...